today I want to focus on a different wall inside the Pyramid of Unas. And this wall is on the south side of the antechamber. So let me take you back to virtual Unas so you can see where this wall is. And what we're going to do is to go back to coming from the entry. Just to get oriented. So um, this is coming into the interior chamber system of the Pyramid of Unas. This is the entry corridor and we're coming in from the north. And so what we're looking at immediately is the south wall. This is the south wall of the antechamber. Here's a little bit of the, the roof of the passage. That's why the stars look so large. But if we go inside, then you see the, the roof, the gabled roof above the chamber. This is the antechamber. This is the east wall to our left. This is the west wall over here. And the particular part of the pyramid text that I'm interested in is, is most of pyramid text 260. 260 begins actually here on the west wall. And it has to do, the beginning of it involves Unas getting ready to leave the netherworld, which is called the Duat, and now enter the Achet zone, the horizon, because the ultimate goal, of course, is for Unas to traverse to the east and then ascend into the sky. So he has resurrected inside of the netherworld where Osiris dwells. And now he, is, he wants to be released from the bowels of the earth and make it to the next station. And the next station is the Achet. And so the text that I'm going to focus on are the first eight columns of the south wall over here. So this would be the Western aspect of the South Wall. And over here, this would be the Eastern aspect of the South Wall. And I'm going to show you uh, to what extent this correlates with astronomy in just a moment. It's actually very interesting. As you can see, the symbols are facing to the right, which is to the West. And that actually has something to do with the movement, astronomically speaking, of this journey across this wall, because that is how the moon faces. Um, and I will show this to you in a moment. So this is fascinating, uh, a fascinating aspect of the pyramid text, the topography of the pyramid text, that uh, you are basically staring out into the sky as you're reading this, and you imagine the things that go on out there while the words describe the events that you're basically, that you would be seeing in the sky. So this is sort of like uh, uh, planetariums of, of sorts. This is one of my friends had this as an impression, uh, Jamie, he thought this uh, is kind of like a planet planetarium where you have a projection of the sky against um, a wall and, uh, and you imagine basically what goes on there. So this is really interesting. So I'm gonna get into it in a moment. But uh, so the text that we're gonna focus on are these first eight columns. And the reason why I want to focus on this has to do with the, the statue per se of the Great Sphinx and specifically what that statue used to be and the name of that statue after the old kingdom. Because there is something hidden in here that has been missed. Um, and to, I have to give you a little bit of update, uh, uh, a little bit of background on this because there is actually a name of the Great Sphinx mentioned on this wall and that's Horachti. Um, so let me take you to the Great Sphinx right now to explain. So this is the Great Sphinx. In front of the Great Sphinx is a stone plate made from granite called uh, the Dream Stealer. And on the Dream Stealer, you see two sphinxes facing opposite ways. And the name of the, the monument, the statue is written right above, which is Hor M. Achet. So Hor M. Achet clearly is the name of the statue, but there's another name also written below in the text here, and it's over here, and that's Horachti, the living statue. And there's no doubt that 
both of these names refer to the actual statue. So this is a little bit of confusing why there are two names for the same thing. Robert Bouval tried to figure this out and he proposed that maybe these two statues are not the same thing. They're not, the one is the statue and he proposed that the other one might be an image of the statue in the sky. And he concluded that this could be the constellation Leo and he thought maybe Leo is Horachti and the statue on the ground is Horamachet, the actual Great Sphinx. And the way he pieced this together in terms of the pyramid text, so, so I want to take you back um, over here, is that there is a section here, which I'm not going to get into today, but in this section, it describes a journey across the sky on reed floats where the spirit of Unas is joining Horachti and the sun to the east. So it's a journey that goes from west to east. And what is awaiting Unas over on the eastern aspect of this journey is Horachti. And this is how Robert figured that this could well be the constellation Leo that's waiting for the spirit of Unas in the east and Unas coming from the west. So the, the name Horachti is clearly mentioned here. There's no, uh, there's no mistake about it that there's an explicit mention of, of the name Horachti. And if that was a name of the Sphinx even back then when Unas pyramid was made, which is the old kingdom, then that is a reference in essence to the Sphinx. But what about Horam Achet? Well, the problem is that there is no mention of Horam Achet, as far as we know, in the pyramid text. But is there? So this is what I wanted to focus on today, because there may be a cryptic reference to the statue itself in the form of Horam Achet. And in fact, there may be a cryptic reference in the immediate vicinity of that name, of that cryptic name Horam Achet, and that is what that statue used to be before in our model, and that is the lioness Mahid. So there is a sort of a cryptic reference to the statue per se in the pyramid text, as far as I'm concerned, but it was not allowed to be mentioned. And of course, there is a reason for that, um, which is something that we're going to get into in our documentary that we're filming and we will um, expand on this theory why the statue could not be named, which is a strange thing because, of course, the statue at this point was only 150 years old. It existed clearly. Uh, it would have been famous. Uh, it would have been a striking appearance in, at Giza. And here, only 15 kilometers south in Saqqara, we have a pyramid that has all these religious texts, but there's no mention of the most amazing statue that's ever been built. So this is strange in and of itself, but I think there is a good reason for it. And that has to do with something that happened to the statue and it may have been desecrated um, to some. And those are the same people that ended up composing these texts. And so that's why the statue was not mentioned directly by name. And in fact, its origin, which is what we think the line is Mahid, also could not be mentioned directly by name because that cult had been erased. So anyways, this is a, a, a long intro to um, just a few lines of text, but I think it's necessary so that you understand the context. So before I now uh, go to the actual hieroglyphic test, so I want to show you the astronomy now. So what you're looking at is the southern sky. This is the ecliptic arc with the constellations, the zodiac constellation. And I've only highlighted a few because otherwise it'll get too cluttered. But a more, and an important uh, part of this uh, view is, uh, first of all, this is the summer, this is around the summer solstice. So the sun is about to rise in the east here into Leo. And in the old kingdom around the time of Unas, the constellation Leo was just above the horizon when the summer solstice sun was about to rise. And then we have Cancer, Gemini, Taurus, we have Orion here, Sirius, but here is the Milky Way. And the journey that uh, is described on that wall is basically the journey from the Western aspect where Orion is. And Orion, of course, is the starry representation of Osiris. So this is the resurrection zone here, the Duat, the netherworld. And 
now the spirit traverses to the east across the Milky Way. And there is an amazing uh, correlate with, to that on the northern side because it speaks of a ladder actually that has to be ascended in order to first get up to the ecliptic and then the reed floats on the southern wall that's the, from the text I just mentioned that Robert described, take the spirit across the Milky Way. And so this is obviously a journey that does not take just one day, it takes several days. And now if you take a look at see what happens to, to the moon, as you go through those days, you see that the moon is waning. So as the moon wanes, you, you get to see the face of the moon pointing towards the west. But the moon is day by day moving closer and closer to the sun as it wanes, heading for the new moon alignment. And so that is why the face of the moon is basically looking in the opposite direction as the moon is moving, which is towards the east. And this is a day by day journey in this case, not the night, the daily journey I'm referring to. Um, and so remember what I said about the way the symbols are facing, the symbols are facing to the west, just like the moon's face is facing to the west, even though the reading direction is from west to east, either, in other words, from right to left, just as the moon is moving towards the sun. So this is a fascinating aspect of the pyramid text that is, has not been appreciated as yet. And I just wanted to point this out that this is coded into the text for because we are this, this moon fairy that does this journey across the Milky Way is actually mentioned by name and it is called face in the back. And that's how the ancient Egyptians codified this idea that you have a moon that's going backwards basically against the direction of the face. Okay, so um, now what I'm gonna do is uh, to show you the eight columns of text here in magnified form. So what I've done here is basically splice together two photos from Alexander Spionkov's publication uh, where he translates, uh, where he had surveyed the pyramid texts and, and he had taken photos uh, that uh, were actually taken by Natasha Rambov. Uh, there's an actress from Hollywood, uh, a set designer that met Alexander Piyakov um, and she came to Egypt, she was, uh, a hobby Egyptologist, and she ended up taking these amazing photos. So we're going to look at these few columns of text. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, up to this point. So this is the most of pyramid text 260, and it ends over here. Um, and now what I've done in order to make this a little bit easier is may, um, I'm going to take this entire photo and uh, put it into into Microsoft Paint and so that I can go step by step so that you can see the hieroglyphic text as I'm, as I'm going to try to translate it and read it and translate it for you. Uh, so first what we have to do is magnify this. And so now remember that the text is a continuation from the West wall and that's not so important, but I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to translate as a continuation. So this says he, which is jubilation, M, Chep. So I'm going to mark each word. So he means jubilation. And this is just a continuation from a sentence from that started on the West Wall, but it's not so important right now. So <clears throat> jubilation, he, M, Chep, Chepesh. Chepesh is basically the, the bones, the limbs, the, or the thighs, you could say. So make jubilations with the bones nigh off the fathers. Itu, itu means the fathers, and sen means there. So with the bones of their fathers. So Unas is basically making jubilations with the bones of his fathers. It's a metaphor, but it's not so important right now. Um, I, I mer means uh, to want, okay, and it he wants he wants to be uh, justified. So this is sort of judgment day, 
in Egyptian mythology that we are talking about now in these eight columns. It has to do with Unas being judged by by uh, a panel of uh, underworld uh, a tribunal, so to speak, that judges him and releases him from his sins during life so that he can ascend into the sky later. So um, so he wants to be Ma Ma O Ma it says M A Kheru Kheref. Kheref means he's the, the F means he. So he wants to be uh justified. Ma o Kheru means basically uh uh literally it means Kheru means voiced or pronounced and ma'o means in an orderly fashion, justified. So it means justified or pronounced just or pronounced orderly. So that's the, uh, that's that in English, you would say judged basically. So he, uh, I, I meres that he wants to be judged. Uh, M, and then it says, uh, M, I, I retinef in what he has done, M, in what he has done, I retinef means what he has done. And then the text continues, Ayu is a, is a, this here is a word that usually is used in front of a sentence uh, that has a verb that describes action that happens right now. It's not translated, but it just marks a certain type of grammatical, a grammatical sentence. So Ayu, and then this says uja n uja n means uh, they have they judge they have judged or they judge for unas uja n unas they judge for unas uh, and then it says here tef tefen hena tefenet tefen is interesting it brings to mind Tefnut, the the goddess that is moisture, the natural power of moisture, the natural force of moisture. The direct translation is actually orphan. Tefen is orphan, Hena Tefenet. So an orphan and an orphaness. So this is a reference to something that's a little bit cryptic here, but it has to do with this tribunal. Um, are you? Ayu again said gem sejem n means to to listen to hear maoti the the maoti are the t ending means that we're referring to two of the same thing and ma maot maot is of course order justice order in the universe cosmic order so we have two cosmic orders that have listened um, basically to Unas' claim that he should be justified. And then here it continues now, Ayu, Shu, and Shu is of course one of the double lines. So he's the, the air part, tef, with Tefnut being moisture. So this is an interesting confirmation now that this may in fact be a phonetic insinuation, a, a Heka that is, that we're talking really about Tefnut. So Tefen and Tefenet, Tefen and Tefnut, because here's where we have Shu. And of course the two go together. So we are talking potentially about the double line in attendance uh, at this tribunal. So then we keep, we go to the next column and Shu now is the, the, uh, the Met, Meteru, and this is the determinative for Meteru, and that means witness. So Shu is sitting, is, is attending as a witness to this trial over Unas. Uh, Ayu, Uj, Uj means to command, okay? Ujen, Mauti, so the, the two, so the trial has been concluded and now comes the judgment. So the command, the judgment or the commandment is that the uh, the uh, the two cosmic orders, Pesher uh, and F, Pesher and F means serve to him to Unas. So the judgment is that there shall be 
tuunas shall be served, the nesut, nesut means the thrones of Geb, which means Geb is the earth god. Geb is the son of Tefnut and Shu. So here we have all the gods in it. We have more of the Enead, the nine gods of uh, Heliopolis in attendance here. So here's Geb. So the thrones of Geb, the earth, the earthy, earthly thrones of Geb shall be given to Unas. And then it says, uh, Dezi means to elevate. Dezief means so that he shall elevate. And Su means he. So shall elevate him. And me, Meretenef. So where he wants to what to what he wants so he shall be elevated to what according to his his wishes um then this says uh dem this war this is a verb again so the egyptian sentences usually begin with the verb the predicate rather and then the subject of the sentence so that's why this is a good way to orient yourself because obviously there's no punctuation between the words and so when you see the verb, then that usually means this is a beginning of a new idea, a new sentence. So damage, damage means to join, actually physically join, damage. And what is being joined are the all, uh, this is plural, so it's all uh, ut, uh, his, his limbs. So Unas has been a mummy, he's been a body that's broken. Uh, he's he's been dead now. He's been revived, and now he's supposed to uh, be. He's judged. He he will be cleared basically to enter the horizon, and during this process, he will be able to collect his limbs and reattach them to himself. And this is very Osirian, of course, because uh, Osirian mythology is the is the the hacking to pieces of Osiris, the original. Uh, God of, uh, of, of, of the first time, the ruler of the first time, and he was hacked to pieces and then he was reunited. So this is a, a very nice bridge, a textual bridge to the idea that, uh, that Unas is really a, a, a reincarnation of Osiris and his limbs are being put back together. So this is what Demej stands for here. And so and where is this happening? Well, it's happening. Uh, this reuniting of the limbs is happening. I'm, I'm at the within, or inside. Sheta, shetau means this the uh, the secret, the secrets. So it's a secret place where this happens. Um, and the next sentence now is zema zemaf means he shall he shall uh, unite. Um, so this is there's physical joining, which is damage. It's actually joining together, coupling. But zema, zemaf is a more abstract form of this idea of unifying. Okay, so unifying as a more abstract form of joining. So zema, zemaf, he shall unify aimu, and that means the ones who are in in Nu, and Nu is the cosmic sea. So he shall, and that's probably the star. So he's he's basically going to collect himself, his, his own limbs, and then he will unify the, the chaos in the sky, the chaotic stars. Okay, so the next column, Redai, Redaif means he shall give, he shall give, Pay, there's the back of the line, uh, by the way. Um, the front of the line, we don't have to get into this right now, but this is a very old hieroglyphic symbol. This is one of the first symbols that was invented, as far as we know. It is the back portion of the line. And of course, Robert Schock and I think that this was inspired by a split line statue uh, at Giza. And that's why it became a symbol, because it was considered sacred. And so it it was basically uh, used as a as a symbol by itself. It stands for Heka, Heka magic. In this particular spelling, Pehu, it means end. So he shall give Unas shall give an end Pehu. 
to medu, med is word, medu is plural, so medu, words, am in ayunu, so in Heliopolis. What does this mean? So uh, he shall, so he, remember, he, he's collecting himself, his own limbs. He's uh, unifying the chaotic, the chaos in the sky. And what he's also doing, he is, he is uh, giving order to chaos in the world, on the ground, at even at a sacred site like Heliopolis. So words in Heliopolis basically means there is arguing, there's contention going on, and he is basically pacifying it. He's putting an end to such contentions, which is what rulers do. They basically say, stop, and everybody be quiet, uh, and there shall be peace. So um, at least at the surface. So, uh, and then the next word is now uh, this word, sec. Uh, sec can mean different things. Destroy, for example, has a military context, but in this particular area, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a conjunction word. It basically means now. So now, now here comes, it is a good uh, word to start uh, this sentence, because this sentence is now where we find the cryptic reference to Horam Ahed. So I'm going to show this how this works. First, let's translate the sentence. So it says now, Unas, that's the cartouche of Unas, Unas Perai, he, he, shall, he shall come forth, M Heru, Heru means today. So he shall, on the, on, uh, Heru means day, and Here's the, here's the determinative that tells us that Heru means day. And then pen means this. So what this means is now Unas shall on this day shall emerge, come forth on this day. M Heru pen. And what, what will happen? It, it says uh, M as I, I Ru. And that means form. So I'm going to write this over here because this is going to be important. So in the form, I uh, I rule and notice there is a line symbol here. Of course, it's used as a as a as the sound ru, but it is not by coincidence. I think that. This is because it could have been spelled another way with an R for the mouth symbol, for example, but they chose the lion symbol because we are in a lion context. We are in a statue context, um, which is what I'm proposing. So this makes perfect sense. I rule. So he's coming forth on this day in the form. And then it says, um, it says, uh, ma. Ma'a means uh, in in the true in the true justified in the orderly form, so in he's coming forth in the true form of an ach, ach. So he's coming forth as a spirit, and ach is uh, is the combination of the person's soul and the life force combined together. It's the ultimate goal after in the afterlife to be able to do that, so that you because that is. Only the only way that you can ascend into the sky. So the Ach is the spirit, the star spirit, so to speak. And the true form is the is in the form of this spirit that's alive. And so let me show you how we can get Hormachet out of this. This is fascinating because Heru the, the today. Oh, this, I'm sorry, this means day, Heru means day, pen means this. So Heru pen means today, this day. But of course, Heru also means, can be read as Horus. So here's Horus, and I'm going to make this dark red so we can, we can construct this. Here is the word M, and that comes from on this day, in the form, but it means the 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 owl sign just means in. So we have Heru M, and then of course we have the Ach, the spirit. 
and it's the life spirit, okay? So, Heru M, Ach, of course, can be read as Heru Hor M Achet, and that is the name of the Great Sphinx in the New Kingdom. So, in a cryptic form, and the clue, of course, the line here inserted. And of course, we had lines, we had Tefnut, we had Shu in before. So we are geared, we're basically prepped from the first three columns of the text to think about lions. And then in an enigmatic sort of way, uh, the statue of the Great Sphinx is insinuated. The question is, is it intentional? Well, I think it is, but of course this, I have to leave up to you to decide, but I just wanted to show you how Hekka magic works. It is, it is at the art of insinuation without actually saying something. And in this particular case, there is a good reason potentially not to, to name the statue because there could have been, there may have been a problem at this time with mentioning the statue because whoever composed the text may have felt that the statue was desecrated when it was converted from a lioness to a sphinx. And this is, of course, I'm referring to the model that there was a statue there before. I know that the Egyptologists disagree with that. They're saying that the Great Sphinx was built from scratch, and that's fine. Um, but I am speaking now from the perspective of the challenging model that there was a statue there before. And this, all of this makes perfect sense in that sort of environment where you have a cult that was replaced by another and it had to be. Uh, it had to be silenced, basically, and it's, it was only a, a allowed by a few people that are, there were in the know still to surface in this sort of cryptic form. Okay, so on we go with the text. Um, now it says, uh, so he's coming today out as in the form of a true spirit, a star, a star spirit. Uh, I, so this says, I said which means that he may break up or stop, that he may break up, and aha means fighting, that he behen, behenef, that he may uh, calm down, shenu, which is commotions. So this is again, Unas is, Unas is uh, here to make peace, to create, to be order. And that's, it's beautifully done because of course he is justified He's now the representative of cosmic order, and he is creating order as he as he emerges now. So um, then we then we say perai uh, una, so he emerges unas. We go back up. Air maot air maot. So he emerges with, with cosmic order, with justice, Maot. Ainenetef. So this means he has come. I'm sorry, he has brought, not he has not come. He has brought. Ainenetef. This T is an interesting, we don't have to get into it, but it's basically... Uh, it's a, it's a, it is a special grammatical form uh, that is seen in this type of verb here. This is, and Ainai means to bring. So he is, he's coming forth. He's just, he's bringing order. Ainetef, he's bringing it as, so he's referring to order. He's bringing order with him. He's bringing justice with him. And of course, he's causing order all over the place, as we just mentioned, as I just mentioned. So, so. This is it's just a reiteration of that, that in his appearance, order is created, basically. So he brings order with it. And I es cheref, that means order is with him. So they're inseparable, in other words. Um, ru means rage in this particular case. Ru, NF, so rage for him. De, dej. De, den, den edge. Okay, so rage has been basically uh, has been calmed. Uh, pesh, pesh, uh, here this says pesher nf. Serve. This means to serve pesher nf to him. 
I Mu Nu. So these are the star. Basically, he's referring to the Scott this the stars. They are not called chaotic anymore. They are now ordered, and that means they can serve him. So Peshir and F to him the 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 ones that are in in the night sky. In, yeah, I'm I'm new. And they are alive. So this refers to the, the ones in in uh, in the sky. Then we have Ayu Ayu Nehet. Ayu Nehet is um, protection. It's a type of uh, protection. Unas um, he, uh, or he's um, he's he. That's his refuge, so to speak. His refuge is in his eye. So he's carrying, of course, the high of horse. M ayret means in, in in with his eye. Ayu maket means protected. Unas M ayret M ayret. So he's protected. He's uh, that's his refuge. Ayu nechet. That's his strength. Nechet means strength. Uh, unas M ayret. So this is a repetitive formula um, that is basically uh, telling, announcing to the world that Unas is, is untouchable. He is, uh, he's strong, he's protected, and that's because he's wearing the eye of Horus. Uh, Ayu User means power. Unas M Iretef, so he has the power because of the eye. And then it says, I, this, uh, I, this is the word sign, so I is used as a word. I means O, O gods, Neteru. Uh, Resu means south, so O gods of the south. Now here we have a cryptic reference to Mehit. It says Mehetiu, in other words, the northern ones. It, you, of course, you could say, well, this is just, this has nothing to do with Mehit, but I just wanted to point out the spelling here. Um, because the spelling is of Mehit. This is from the, the famous wooden panel of Hesi Ra. You can see this in the Cairo Museum. So here's Mehit with the jaw sign, uh, Meje, and I've translated this to mean Babu opener. It's a, it's a Sumerian connection. It's on my YouTube channel, uh, the whole presentation of this, but Meje, Babu, Mehit. Uh, and then here is how you spell the name of the line is actually Mehet, Mehit. Um, so so in, in this particular case, it's used as the, uh, the word for the Northerners. So the Resu, the Mehetiu, the Aimentiu are the Westerners. So he's basically, it's saying, oh gods of the South, uh, of the North, of the West, and the Ayabetiu are the, the uh, Ayabetiu are the Eastern gods, uh, Maki means protect Unas, uh, or, or Unas is protected. Said uh, Senej and F, that means be fearful of him. Hemes uh, and he has sat down, M, in. And now here it says the Hat, the Hatiu which is, as you can, I don't know if you can make this out, but this is in the shape of uh, a pavilion, an awning, basically. So he has set in the awning or the pavilion of the hu, hui, the two enclosures, okay? So the hui, there's two signs, two enclosures or two hall houses. So he has set in the awning of the two houses, the two temples, for example, and, uh, and remember, we're in a, potentially in a Sphinx context, and we are in a Horem Ahed context, uh, cryptically speaking. And so this is an interesting, again, uh, potential reference to the two temples in front of the Sphinx. I'm just bringing it up as a possibility. But it gets more interesting because, look, M, Hatiu, Hu, Hui, there's really, what's hiding in there is the word Mehit. So Meh. Hetiu, Mehetiu, and there is the word who, which is an, an important word, because who 
is the deified facility of the creator God to utter to create while ut with utterances okay so it's the, it's basically the concept of logos in Abrahamic religion when God creates the world he thinks about it and he he pronounces it he says it and by doing so he creates and that is the idea of who in ancient Egyptian mythology it has to do with the Memphite cosmogony the facilities of Petah when he created the world were intellectual their perception and and utterance so perception is saya and utterance is who and this the um this word who is intimately associated with the sphinx but it's more so with mehit um because mehit is associated with writing with archiving this is from the early dynastic phase of egypt and the word who is that is the word that will be that will be recorded by the writers. The, it's the sacred word of creation that will be recorded. And of course, who is also part of Heka. So when you do Heka magic, you are uttering words to uh, to to animate certain ideas, and by the, the mere utterance of it. So you are creating and uh, the, these these things to basically to come alive and the act of doing that is called who so this is a interesting context here with a potential cryptic reference to mihit to utterance who which is heka which has to do with creation um, and all of this is mentioned together in a in a in a very innocent looking column that appeals to the gods of the south and the north. So this is how Heka works. It preps you just like here before. Remember, Horem Achet was prepped because we had a line context. Uh, we had Tefnut and Shu. We had the double line. And so you you get prepped, basically, you get primed to think about lines. And then when you read that column uh, with this cryptic reference to Horem Achet, then and you see the, the line symbol, then of course you start thinking about lines. And that is how enigmatic writing may have worked. It's big it it actually takes you there. It's not trying to keep it secret. It is trying to make you think about it without actually saying it directly. And here we have the same idea. We have the directions, the cardinal directions. As part of the four cardinal directions, you mentioned north, Mehetiu, the northern, the northern ones. And so you are phonetically already sort of in a new in a new place now that you might consider it when you see it again. And then you and then as you read the text. You know, you say, I bet you, Maki Unis said Genef, NF, Hemesenef, Mhetiu, Mehetiu, Mhetiu, Mhetiu. See what I'm saying? So it just kind of flows off the tongue, and you start thinking, ah, oh, maybe that's interesting. And then you have the confirmation with who. Um, and interestingly, you have two temples uh, or two edifices referred to. So long story short, I just wanted to show you, uh, Heka is an interesting concept, but you have to go through it slowly so you can really appreciate the ins and outs of it, the details, so it's fascinating. So let's go on uh, with the rest of the text. So then it says, um, am, am amenthen means uh, burning, uh, and then me it's a reference to plural you so burning and then it says the acheti ureas so this is referring to the ureas the 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 effective ureas so the ureas is the cobra on the forehead of unas as he ascends into the sky same with the sun god uh, it is a symbol of the power of heka basically of the power to create uh, and uh, that's why it's brought up here, and it's and it's on fire, right? So that's why it's amen. It's uh, it's basically flaming. This is the fire sign. Uh, uh, so it says achet achet tu, and then here is this word is genenutet. Genenutet is the name of this ureus, uh, the the cobra on the forehead, the the this symbol of of creative power and it shall this this uh this is an interesting symbol because uh people that know the names of khufu they know this symbol from because this is one of the names of khufu Med, meju 
Kufu Meju, so uh, Heru Meju means horror striker, uh, horse presser. So here it's used as in the in the term in in the sense of pressing. So Mejes, I I boot me, pressing the heart. So this is obviously, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I boot I boot then your hearts, pressing the hearts. This is some kind of idiom. It's a it's a phrase uh, uh, a, a phrase of speech. Um, not so easy necessarily to to derive what this might mean, but it's kind of like maybe be impressionable on you or create some kind of emotional reaction in you. Uh, just the appearance of Unas with the ureus on his forehead, which is called genen genen genu, genenutet. Um, I I would send so those who have. Those who have come uh, with respect against Unas, am red, am, uh, I'm, I'm I red, I'm I red. So those who have basically come in opposition or in to hinder Unas, so they come basically to cross his way, crossing his path. It's actually, you can literally translate it like that with the cross, even though it doesn't mean the cross, but in this case, it just happens to work out per perfectly. So those who cross his path or those who are an impediment, M, uh, I, I, N, F, uh, may they come to him, M, I, E, S. So it's repeated twice. So in other words, he's a peacemaker. He's saying, if you're against me, don't be against me. Come with me, join me. Uh, then it says, unas pi, jes, jes, unas pi means unas, unas it is, jes, jes means self, and itef. So he him he is basically one and the same. Jess Jess means himself, self, uh, his father, his father being Osiris, of course. So it's basically Unas is Osiris, is basically presenting himself as a reincarnation of Osiris himself, Jess Jess. Okay, and then it goes on. Uh, nech, nech, uh, nech, bet. Nechep, Nechep means uh, it's the lotus bud. Uh, Nechep, Nai, belonging to Mayutef, means is his mother. So he's the lotus bud of his mother. So this is a beautiful bridge to the lotus flower, um, which is, goes back to archaic cosmogony where the lotus arises from the deep of the water and releases the sun. And so that is what's bringing us beautiful language. It's basically resonate. It's giving you all these res these extra uh, semantic uh, uh, overtones. So it paints a beautiful picture of of Unas coming, presenting himself after judgment. Uh, bet bet means is um, is an abomination basically. Bet Unas. So Unas is abomination. Who it is what is this abomination is the is shas shas means to stride just like osiris so that's uh that's an again goes back to the idea that he is one and the same with osiris and osiris is orion in the sky and orion is a striding figure um it's a it's a further evidence that the ancient egyptians really thought that osiris is the entire is the constellation orion not just the belt stars or not just one star um uh keku means in the darkness so his ab abomination is basically to stride in the darkness he wants light uh nai nai means is is negative means not uh ma mm, i yeah he 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 can he does not Ma'a means ma'af means he does not see, he cannot see, or he does not see. The sechedu, so this is interesting. The sechedu are, as you can see, it's an upside down symbol. It's kind of a, it's also in, in modern mythology, uh, more modern mythology, being upside down, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a negative connotation. It has to do with hell, basically, right? So you're like, for example, Peter crucified upside down. So it's a it's a bad sign. So he can and and of course the the sentence begins with abomination. So it is his abomination to stride 
in the dark uh, with where he can't see the, the ones that are hanging upside down, basically. And then it says uh, pair, which means to emerge, unas, em, em, he, he pen. This is, uh, of course, the familiar phrase now from the previous column. So unas emerges today, ein, einetef, so he's, this is a rep repetition of what we had before. He's, he's bringing justice and, and order, cosmic order, and justice and cosmic order is also with him. Eis, uh, eis, eis, her, so I, I es heref, so that she, order, be near him. Nai, it then this says nai, it's a negative again, nai, uh, nai, redu, he shall not give, he shall not give, uh, shall, or shall not give unas, uh, nes, this is a tongue sign, so this is n, nes, nes means fire, then their fire, he shall not give, uh, he shall, he shall not be, you know what, I misread this, this should be passive, yeah, not, not, be given, not shall unas be given to the fire of the gods. So this is basically um, purgatory or hell. He shall not be remain in hell. He shall not, he shall not burn, so to speak, in ancient Egyptian hell. I'm not talking about Abrahamic hell, but um, it's the same basically idea, right? So the condemned will not be able to ascend to the sky. They will remain where the upside downers are, the under sky, basically the netherworld. And that's where they burn. And Unas shall not be one of those. So um, this is now the, and this is the end of this column. So we've read basically these first eight columns of the South End. And uh, I uh, wanted to just summarize real quick what uh, this is all about. So it has to do with judgment. Um, he's emerging from the Duat, from the netherworld. He's about to enter the horizon to embark on this astronomical journey across the Milky Way from west to east uh, with the moon, um, as I mentioned. And in order uh, for him to be, a, to be able to ascend um, like that, he, he has to be justified. And he was, he was cleared basically by the underworld tribunal, the gods uh, in attendance. And part of that was Shu and Tefna, the gods. And uh, within this general context, of course, we have now a cryptic reference to Mehit and Hormachet, the Great Sphinx. And that makes sense because they, the Great Sphinx is sort of the guardian to the underworld, to the netherworld, to a cemetery in Giza where, um, and so it makes perfect sense, but uh, there is more proof. Uh, this is just one place that I wanted to focus on because it sets the stage for the evidence, other evidence that is on the other walls. And of course, all of that will be, will be we're, we're filming all of this in the next few weeks and hopefully we'll make this into a film where you can see the whole story unfold. And so I'm just giving you little chapters of it at this point.